الحمد للہ رب العالمین و صلاۃ وسلام رسول اللہ کریم و علی و سب اجمعین اشر ولا الہ الا اللہ و اطلاع شریق اللہ و اشر محمد عبد رسول و اشر وانا عیس عبد رسول علیہم سلام السلام علیکم How many of you know what I said in Arabic? How many of you don't know? How many don't care? <laughs> There we go. By the way, I don't know about the moderator coming out here and telling better jokes than I do. I don't like that. <laughs> I guess I'll forgive him for that. And the coffee spill. We'll get over it. Okay. The subject, Jesus, man, myth, or God? What do you think? Well, first of all, let us consider this, that as Muslims, we have six articles of faith that if a person leaves one of them, then they have left Islam. And one of those articles Number three is to believe, actually number four, is to believe in the prophets, all of them, in a very high and substantial way that there's no misunderstanding. They are the best and the best of the best of the human beings. And before we begin the program, I want you to know that we in no way are intending to make fun of the prophet Isa alayhi salam, nor his miracles, nor his mother, whom Allah said about her, she is the best woman that Allah created. So we'll say that up front. And then uh, also any comments I make along the way that you might find humorous, uh, let us uh, remember that's just Yusuf S. is doing that and I can't help it, I'm from Texas. One of the things when we have a speaker or an author of a book, we'd like to know a little bit about that person And that's fair because <clears throat> that's part of considering the source to know something about the speaker or the author of a book. And because I'm the speaker, I'll have to just tell you myself, and this is going to be a bit subjective, and that is that I've been reading the Bible since I was old enough to read. My father, the same way. My father was one of the very first people in, at his time about... 80 some years, uh, yeah, about 90 years ago now, to have completed the Bible, and he won an award for that in our church. And the Bible has always been a, a source of inspiration and uh, refuge for us from the problems of life. I have a high respect for it, even though I will tell you immediately, it didn't come in English. It didn't. <coughs> Uh, have the chapters in it uh, at the time of Jesus that we see today. But at the same time, there are things in the Bible, even in translation, that Muslims will say, this is true because we have that also in Quran, so we have respect. And we know that even though things have been altered, changed, played with, there's still a lot of truth there, and we don't ever want to insult anything that came from Allah. And I came to Islam in 1991, in July, while trying to convert a Muslim to come to Christianity. Some of you have heard the story, but along the way we discussed the Bible and we discussed in particular Jesus and what his role is in Christianity versus his role in Islam to the Muslims. The background that I have in Christianity may not be very interesting to you and I won't bore you with it, but I spent 47 years around a lot of preachers from the Methodists, from the Baptists, from the Church of God, the Charismatic Movement, the Born Again Christians, the Disciples of Christ, and in some cases even sitting with some of the Catholics, although I never was a practicing Catholic nor did I attend any of their services, but still we sat and dialogued and had a lot of brainstorming discussions about Bible, Jesus, etc., and God, of course. In Islam, the background that I'll offer 
my experience has been from graduates of Al-Azhar, even visiting Al-Azhar itself, that's in Cairo, Egypt, and in Maghreb, which is more commonly called Morocco, and in Turkey, and Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and a bunch of places, sitting with a number of known scholars that you might recognize their names and some you may have never heard of, doesn't really matter, and some of the conclusions that I draw may not be exactly what some of them would say, and they may disown me totally, so don't blame them for my mistakes, okay? Having said that, it's not much of an introduction for the background, but at least to get some idea. I want to, to read to you a little bit of what we have in the Quran, and I think that can answer a lot of questions before we get too deep into anything else. Because uh, what we find that, uh, as an example, this is in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 161, Allah is telling us that no prophet, this is any messenger of God, no prophet can be false to his trust. If any person is false, then he shall on the day of judgment restore what he misappropriated, then shall every soul receive its due, whatever it earned, none shall be dealt with unjustly. And there's a rhetorical question, is the man who follows the good pleasure of Allah like the man who draws on himself the wrath of Allah and whose destiny is being in the hell fire? What a woeful refuge. There are in varying grades in the sight of Allah, and Allah sees well all that they do. This is a general statement about human beings and prophets, and it is something that sets, I think, the tone for what we're talking about. Now, when it comes to the subject of Jesus, and we already spoke about that in the question and answer period earlier, but I'll mention it again for the benefit of those who might have just come in. We know that the name of the person who lived 2,000 years ago that was attributed to have been a miracle birth from the descendants of Israel and also was claimed to have been crucified, then we know that that person was not named Jesus. Everybody knows that because nobody was named Jesus at that time. It would have been impossible because the word wasn't invented yet. What we have in English when we say Jesus is a corrupted form of the name Yeshua or Isa, depending on if you want to say it in Hebrew or in Arabic language, okay? So having got this, the name itself out of the way so that when we make reference, when I say Jesus, for the Muslims or Jews that might be here, I'm still talking about the same one. Okay. Let us uh, consider the first part, man. According, according to the language of the Bible, translated in English, we find that in the book of Isaiah, of the Old Testament, if you categorize it that way, <laughs> the prophet Isaiah, he's telling us that there will be one who will come who is going to be, a woman is going to give birth and she is, according to some translations, a virgin and she's going to give birth. And since then, some have claimed that no, it just meant a young maiden woman. So for the Jews, they'll say no, it doesn't mean a virgin birth. But for us as Muslims, we're going to say yes, it is because this is what we have in the Quran as well. But it does say, Clearly, that this is a man child, a man child. And also, the, in the New Testament, we find an expression coming from Jesus, alias Isa, alias Yeshua, that he is the son of man. Now, this expression, son of man, is an expression very similar to what we find in Arabic, Ibn Adam which means the son of Adam. 
In both cases, they're, they're interchangeable. The son of Adam or son of man would be no different because this is also what we find in the Old Testament reference to when we find in the book of Ezekiel, many of the statements beginning so many chapters that say something to the effect of, say, O son of man. So we have a title here being offered either as the son of Adam or as perhaps a prophet's nomenclature that you can identify him by this, by saying, O son of man, as God is speaking to directly to one of his prophets. And it says, say, O son of man, or in Arabic, kul. And we find this again in the Quran the same way, when it talks to the prophet Muhammad. Okay, so was he a man? Uh, according to everything else that we can find in Judaism, Christianity, and Quran, yes. Okay, there's, so there's no doubt about it. At least one of the qualities of what we put up here has to be true. Man. Because they all said that. Myth. All right, let's find out about the myth. What we know from some of the stories, as I mentioned in the Old Testament, that there will be one who will come and he will be the one who is going to be leading the children of Israel to a victory over their oppressors. So at the time, 2,000 years ago, when Jesus was born, they were in a pretty sad state of affairs. They had a Jewish king, but he wasn't anything more than just really a uh, basically a religious leader under the rule of the Roman government. The Roman government was, you know, it. And they were the ones that had the final say of everything. So many of the things that the Jews would like to do at home, that would be all right. But when it came to anything legal, according to their rulings, they couldn't practice it because they had another government over them that would overshadow that. For instance, if they, went on, they wanted to apply the death penalty to someone who had committed a serious enough infraction against Judaism, they couldn't do so because the Roman government would not allow it. This is evidenced, by the way, from one of the statements that we find in the New Testament when Paul is telling us about having to go to the Sanhedrin to get papers to go to Damascus to uh, persecute the Christians there that the Sanhedrin or the government of the church or the temple, in Arabic this would be the, uh, the Jama'ah, which controls the uh, Majlis Shura, we might say, uh, for the Muslims. And they had to go then to the Roman government to get permission from them. So you see the steps that were involved to get something done. Also, if, they, if you had a thief that stole something and they wanted to apply the law, they couldn't do that again without the Roman permission. If someone was homosexual, they wanted to kill him according to Jewish law, they couldn't do that either without the permission again from the Roman government. So the children of Israel at that time were very much excited looking for a leader. The historical evidence is coming to us from Josephus, also from some of the books that were taken out of the Christian Bible, um, which is now called Apocrypha, books like um, the, there's a number, there's seven of them that were taken out, but there are others as well, dealing with the subject of some of the tribes of Israel and how they operated clandestinely outside of the Roman law, and when they would get caught, they would be thrown in prison and killed and things like that. And uh, if, if you want more information about it, we have some websites for it, but basically they would go out in the night and from the desert and slip into town and do acts, you know, that were subversive, even sometimes killing people and then run back out into the desert again. You know, I guess they were terrorists of those days. Insurgents, I guess they would be called, right? Well, this is what was going on then. And it's, uh, it's well established that that was the condition they were in. They were very much looking for a leader. They wanted their Messiah to come. One of the choices we might have put up there would have been Messiah, because then I would have had a chance to talk about that. Messiah, 
uh, many of you probably know this already, doesn't mean anything more than a chosen person, a person who's chosen to do something in a role of leadership for the Jewish, because it's from a Jewish word. Actually, it's pronounced misah, misahi, and it's also Arabic. Whether you said mishii or masai or masai, it doesn't matter. It all comes from the same mesh, which means to wipe or touch. And this was because when they uh, put one of their own into the role of leadership as a king, they would put their fingers in olive oil, and they, they called it anointing oil, and then they would wipe his forehead in front of the congregation to let everybody know this is the one we've chosen to lead us. That started with the King Saul, and it carried forward for a period of time, and then they were looking for their last king that they were going to uh, install. Then they said he would be anointed by God himself and chosen by God. That's the reference of Messiah or the Chosen One. Am I boring you to death yet? No, some of you are still awake, mashallah. But you can see why some of us fall asleep in seminary school, we'd be like <laughs> You say, I'll just get Cliff's notes later. <laughs> but <laughs> some of you knew what I meant. <laughs> so the role that they were looking for was somebody who would come and lead them and really beat the Romans down. That's what they wanted more than anything because it was prophesied. And they knew the Romans would be beaten down eventually and the believers would have a victory. And they were so excited about it. So when the first thing that comes with Jesus, it looks pretty good to them as far as the records that we have. And that is that here is somebody who is fulfilling the miracle birth thing, at least the claim is there, but then the miracles that come along with him. There were a lot of things attributed to Jesus at the time that they could not ignore. Many people saw somebody has a skin disease and now they're cured. Somebody is a uh, crippled and now they can walk with no assistance from any sticks or crutches. And somebody else is born blind and now they can see and that's totally impossible. And then finally a dead man, been dead four days according to what we have in the English translation of the Bible today. Lazarus is brought back from the dead. Okay, what more do you want? That's the guy, you know. And everybody's happy to the extent that we find in the Bible. And uh, I think all four Gospels are telling us about Palm Sunday. When they have Jesus riding into town on the donkey. And they lay down the palms. And that was a sign of a king coming. You know, to, to lay down, the, like we say, the royal carpet treatment. To put those palms down. And then the donkey goes across them. And, well, there's our king. And this today is what's called Palm Sunday. So he comes riding in on the donkey and they're saying, and we give what it says from the Bible, Hosanna, Hosanna. They're singing and they're happy. This is our guy. He's going to lead us. This is fantastic. Now, if you know anything about the Christian religion, you know that they have Palm Sunday one week before what? Easter. In most places, that's how they do it. They have Palm Sunday a week later, they got Easter, right? But Easter is a celebration, actually, of Jesus coming back out of the grave after being crucified on Friday. By who? The same people that were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna on Sunday, are putting him on a cross? <laughs> what happened? I want to know what happened during that week. Well, what, what took place? Well, you can only guess by trying to patch together some of the different translations of what remains of the manuscripts. Also some, I think it's probably fabrication, but it's not for me to say because I'm not the expert on that. But the translations of Josephus have some reference in there that appear to be added according to some scholars, but in any case, we can always as Muslims go to the Quran and we can see something amazing. And that is that Jesus spoke to them real clear and told them who he was and who he wasn't. According to what we have in the Bible and the English today, and I'm only quoting from the English, I don't know anything about the Norwegian language at all, zero, so if you're reading it from there, I can't help you. But from English, we do have it that it says, 
that uh, Jesus was constantly telling them about following the law, following the commandments, because he was being challenged. Aren't you coming up with something new? Didn't you help somebody that was sick and, or ill or crippled or something and you helped them on Sunday? Or they're actually, it wasn't Sunday as we know, it was actually Saturday, their Sabbath. Didn't you do that and you broke or violated the Jewish law? You can't do any work at all. You can't turn a tap. You can't do anything. Didn't you do that? And he said, wouldn't you at least pull an oxen out of the ditch if he was stuck or, you know, like that? And it's no difference. And he's saying, and I'm doing something better than that. These are some of the things that they refer to. And they were trying to imply that he was coming with something new. But why were they saying that? What was it? Well, again, according to a critical study of the text that is remains, you come up with the idea that there was uh, uh, quite a bit of dissension existing on the part of those of the Sanhedrin or the leadership of the temple at the time because they didn't, they didn't trust him and they were worried about their high position because most of them were uh, known today what we would call somebody a sellout or, and they actually called them the Sadducees. That was the name uh, that they had and the, they were saying, that these guys basically are following the Roman law. They're just kissing up, basically. They're doing what the Romans want them to do and making it look good, walking around in their fancy robes and pretending to be something they're really not. This is the accusation from the general public. So those are the people who are trying to give Jesus a hard time. The common people are pretty much accepting him from what we know of the scriptures and the indications we also have in Islam. Statements like when they ask, what is the greatest commandment? What is the greatest commandment? And the response comes back that the greatest commandment is to know, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. And you have to love him with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength. And a commandment like unto it, to love your brother as yourself. Now, this is a direct quote out of the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6. You can find it for yourself. It's no different. That's the quote. So even though it says, I give you a new commandment, it's not new because it's the same quote. I don't know who put that in there, but they messed up on that because you can go back and see that it didn't say that. It was not new. It's very old. Trivia, who cares? The point was, though, he was saying, I'm saying the same thing it was always said. And we already discussed this, but I'll repeat it again when it comes to the idea of the commandments. You're here telling people to break commandments. No. And now we look in Matthew 5, 17, 18, 19, that I did not come to destroy the law and the prophets. I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. And not until all things be accomplished, shall a single dot or jot or iota or tittle be in any wise lessened from the law. Whoever breaks the least of the commandments, he will be the least in the next life. Whoever keeps the commandments, he'll be the highest in the next life, basically. And unless your righteousness exceeds that of these, and now he's pointing right to those people in saying they're not righteous. Unless your righteousness exceeds these leaders of the temple, the Sanhedrin, then are Pharisees, then you will no wise enter the kingdom. So it wasn't, according to this and what we know, especially in Islam, wasn't coming up with anything new. But was it a myth? And this is our next part that we're talking about. Is this a myth? If anybody said that there was nobody named Jesus, I think they'd be pretty foolish. Uh, that's pretty foolish. There's too much reference within Christianity, within Islam, and even outside of Islam, from the Jewish, from the book of Josephus, he was a chronicler of the time, like a journalist of his time, that you, you just would have a hard time denying that there was somebody named Jesus especially that there were miracles attributed to him, etc. It would be foolish to consider it a myth. But now let's come to the next part. God. According to the different translations of the Bible to the English language, 
that could really be a puzzle for you. Especially when you look to the text, and I'm going to start in Genesis, because it's the first book in the Old Testament, and I'll go to chapter 6, verse 2. It says, the sons of God, this is the Old Testament, this is the very first of the books. Genesis means beginnings. The sons of God saw the daughters of men, found them to be fair, means good looking, and wed them, went in unto them, and from them come the mighty men of old. And it, again, it repeats this thing about the sons of God. What does that mean? Many people have given their own interpretations of what it meant. Some of them are pretty convincing, but none of them have brought any evidence to prove absolutely that that's what it means, but it definitely says it, sons of God. The interesting thing, of course, is that for us and Muslims, uh, we're not obliged to hang with that because we do have texts that didn't get corrupted or changed. All of this is actually coming from scripture that is not as old as some of the other scripture. You might be interested to know, and maybe you don't care, but one of the oldest of the books of the Old Testament is not Genesis or Exodus or Numbers or Deuteronomy. Actually, one of the oldest, according to the scholars, is the book of Job, Ayub. They consider that to be maybe one of the oldest of all. So they're not necessarily in the oldest order. While I'm on the subject of the book of Ayub, though, you still got a problem because chapter 2, you find again the sons of God. We're going to and fro, meaning up and down from earth to heaven. And some said, well, these were the angels. And some said that they were the Ephraim, which we call the jinn in the Arabic. But it doesn't really matter. It still said sons of God. So how are you going to deal with that? Before we go too far, let's consider that it's not, still not the only place that we find this reference. We'll look to something that's far more modern, much closer to the time of Jesus, peace be upon him, and that would be within maybe 500 years before, and that's the time of the revelation of Psalms, the Psalms or Zabur, as they're called in the Arabic language. These are the, the revelations coming to the prophet David, and also the prophet Suleiman, according to the preservers of the Bible. And in chapter 2, verse 7, it has David addressing the congregation. Now, this was something the king used to do, similar to what the president of the United States does when he's inaugurated. He gives an inauguration speech, or every year he gives a state of the onion. I'm sorry, <laughs> union, but it always makes me cry and it smells funny, so anyhow, that's how I get confused. But anyway, <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't review that one. I always want to be sure you're still awake. But anyway, so they have David here uh, doing what the king would do at that time, which is to address the congregation. In other places in the Old Testament, you'll find that he would turn his face and bless the congregation. And it was a, a ceremony, and I've been told it's similar to this. To take your hands, and then they would go like this to bless all the congregation. And that was a blessing coming to you from your king slash prophet, because he was a king and a prophet at the same time. Anyway, at this time, it says that he's saying to them, I will tell you of a decree my Lord has decreed on this day. He's going to quote God. Now, this we have in Islam called Hadith Qudsi. Hadith Qudsi, this means sacred sayings. It's something God has said, but it's not in the Quran, but the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is telling us, your Lord has said this, your Lord has said that. This is Hadith Qudsi. And this is what it's saying here in this book of Psalms or Zabur, Chapter 2, verse 7. I will, I will tell you of a decree your Lord hath decreed on this date, or this day. Thou art my son. 
This day I have begotten you. Well, this is a heavy statement because it happens to be the only place in the Bible where it clearly says that person by name and position is begotten. Even in the New Testament today, which we have in the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 16, the statement that's very, very overstated, overquoted by all the hot gospelers out here in Bible thumpers on the corner, they're all telling you, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believed in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. But nowhere in there does it say Jesus. It's not until, oh, what is it, uh, four or five verses later, Jesus is mentioned in a total different context, but it doesn't say that Jesus is the only begotten son. In fact, if you use the word only here, you're going to have a problem because you already got a begotten son in the Old Testament. Unless, of course, you subscribe to the theory that the New Testament cancels the Old Testament. But then, if you want to play that game, we'll say, okay, the Quran is the last testament. <laughs> and it's not a game. And so it's not, it's not really a, a proper thing to do that. It's, I think if you're going to refer to Scripture, if you're going to refer to anything, to be consistent in the way you refer to it. Don't delete something that doesn't go along with what you like and don't add something because you feel like it ought to be there. Otherwise, uh, why bother? Just make up your own book. Other people do it. Lots of people. Scientologists, they got their own deal. They don't have to rely on anybody else. So, and that's fine. I mean, you know, if you want to make up a religion, have a good time. But when you try to take an existing religion and documents and keep twisting it, you keep making up new factions. You keep coming up with new divisions within what exists. And this is what's happened in Judaism. It's happened in Christianity. And unfortunately, it's happened in Islam amongst Muslims even more so. This division, division, division. And it would be avoided if people would simply go back to the sources. I know here, even in this city where we are right now, there are those that if you went to them, and they're leaders in the religion of Islam, if you went to them and you said, by the way, this is what's in the Quran and this is what the Prophet said, and they don't like that, they'll just ignore it and go on with what they do. True or false? And that's one of the reasons they don't want me to speak in that particular place. <laughs> I snuck that in there, didn't I? I don't care. By the way, nobody pays me to do this. I'm free and I'm worth it. <laughs> uh, that didn't come out right. Back up the tape. <laughs> what we're discovering here is that there's a reference here to Son of God. Now that, by the way, that is not what it says up there. We said God. I'm just talking about this thing, Son of God. Because this is really how the subject comes about. Because, just so you know, 60 years ago, when I was a little guy going to church, nobody said Jesus was Lord or Son uh, or God. They only said Son of God. That was not a popular statement back then not amongst the disciples of Christ, not amongst the Methodists, not amongst... That was just not said like that. They didn't say it. I never heard that until the 60s. And then it became all, all of a sudden just really popular within that 10-year span, that decade right there, right before all the hippies and the jippies and all the rest of it had come along. Flower children, you know, peace. <laughs> it's funny to you. You should have lived through it. <laughs> But this idea of just saying Jesus is God, nobody, nobody would have got away with that back then. But now it seems like they can say that, and it's like, yeah, don't you know it said, uh, no man cometh to, by, to the Father but by me. And you'd say, so how does that make you God? Uh, well, yeah, but it also says that I am the way, the life, and the truth. So how does that make you God? 
Because actually, if you know anything about the language, where it's coming from, if, it, if it's Aramaic, which is the same, almost identical to Hebrew and Arabic, the word would have been deen. The word way would have been deen. But if somebody comes to you and said, well, I'm the father of myself. I know this is Norway, but even here, that's weird. <laughs> huh? Or I'm the son of myself. Huh? This would indicate right away that you don't really know who your grandfather is, that's for sure. <laughs> what I'm saying is that the statements we find, even in the English, where Jesus says that I do nothing of myself, but rather the one who sent me, or the one above, or from the Father, or however it's worded in the different translations, goes along very well with what we find in the Quran. Jesus is a mighty and majestic prophet. He is a messenger of Almighty God. He is the miraculous birth born without any human father. But by the way, if that's the case, then why did he need to have a story about Joseph's genealogy? Matthew 1.1 1, 1 starts with that. Luke 23 starts with it. Neither one of them match each other. What was that all about? And we as Muslims have it real easy. We don't deal with that. We just say, miracle birth. And when God wants somebody to be born without a father, anytime Allah wants anything to be done, he merely says, kun, fayakun. Be, and it is. Simple as that. So that's who Jesus is to us. And then if somebody still wants to believe that Jesus is a myth, well, that's their choice. If they want to believe that he's a God, again, that's their choice. But if they want to believe that he's a man and a messenger of God, that he's far above us in many ways, and that he's really coming back in the last day, and that he's really, really human, and yet having miracles with him, then check out Islam and find out what we say about Jesus. Man, myth, or God. Salam alaikum rahmatullah. I'm going to do it real quick because they tell me we're running out of time, so, uh, and we're changing out of tape here. So, uh, real quick, I'm going to read these. And the answer is, the next one. <laughs> you guys are too much. <laughs> before I go any further, before I answer any questions or do anything else, this is my way, and I have to do something. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salat, wa salam, rasulullah. I want to welcome all of you here and tell you how much I really do care about every single person in this building. I'm serious when I tell you, salam, salam alaikum, peace be upon you. You don't know this because maybe you don't know me, but I will tell you that Islam has taught me clearly what I already believed as a Christian, that all of us, we came from Adam and Eve. As such, we are already brothers and sisters to each other. But I like that reminder that comes to me again and again and again from the Quran that Allah created all of us from one, Wahid. Then from him brought his mate, and from those two brought forth many men and women, Kathirin, Kathirin, Jeddin. So you're my brothers and sisters. Whether you like it or not, you're stuck with me. <laughs> and my ardent desire is not to hurt a single human being ever, but rather to help all of us get closer to the one who created us, to go to paradise, and to be there with the real righteous prophets and the good people. I want to be there, and I want you there too. Amen. Didn't that sound nice? <laughs> Thinking about running for a politician, what do you think? <laughs> no, but seriously, that is what Islam teaches us. But the thing that's even better, you've got brothers and sisters in humanity as children of Adam, but then how about your brothers and sisters in faith? Those who come to the realization there really is a God. And he's one. He has no partners. 
He sent messengers, and those messengers told us how to worship God on his terms. Simple as that. If you like that, and you want to follow that up, then you become even closer to each other because this is being brothers and sisters in Iman, in faith. Somebody is asking here, the, the Bible says that Jesus was crucified. What really happened? Actually, you have some clear texts that are found in today's Bible in English, in the Gospels, talking about what happened at the time of the crucifixion. And Ahmed Didat, may Allah have mercy on his soul, did quite an expose on this, and I, I really enjoyed reading what he said, although I didn't always come to the same conclusions he did, but he certainly had a lot to say about it. But when you compare the Gospel uh, what's called the Synoptic Gospels, to the Johann Gospel, as any student of the Bible knows, they don't match up in their presentation. But more so, the, what's called the Pauline, the Pauline uh, testimony, or the Pauline uh, direction or Gospel, because the way that he's coming with it, Paul has a whole different take on everything. And... If you really separate them, you can see that they're not the same. They really are not the same take. Paul's got this idea that's very much influenced by something called the mystic religion, which was prevalent at his time. And there's a, a study that was done by that in, uh, by one of the Jewish scholars. It was called uh, Jesus, what was the name of it? The myth, myth of the God incarnate, that was the name of it. You get a chance to read it. Myth of the God incarnate. But as far as what we have in the Quran, Allah tells us in the Quran, and I'm going to try to give you the English translation of it, that regarding those people at the time, now remember the Sanhedrin, we talked about them, they were trying to get Jesus out of the way because he was exposing them for being money and power grabbers. Okay, he exposed them, and they hated him. So they were willing to do him in. They and the Romans who were being told that, hey, this guy's claiming he's the new king of Rome, basically. You see, they're trying to play around with that, trying to get them to go and shut him up, lock him up, and they did. They took him in, locked him up, and then after a while, they, they, they take him out to Golgotha, and then crucify him, according to what you read in the Bible. And this has a lot of ramifications that go along with it. It's one of the things that it says in the Old Testament is that, to make it clear that anybody that's ever hung on a tree, they're like the worst, like kufar. So if somebody was hung on a cross, this would really be bad. And the Jews of the time were trying to insist that, yeah, he was. Therefore, you can see he wasn't real. It wasn't the real deal. Also, this was a sign of somebody who was an enemy to the state because to be hung on the cross was like anybody today which would be a spy or somebody who was an enemy to our government or something like that, and that was the punishment of the time. So that was another reason they wanted to say he was on the cross. <laughs> But it wasn't because there was anything sacred about a cross back then at all. That came later. But there are differences of opinions even amongst those that were supposedly giving you the Bible of what actually happened. I'll give you an example. According to one saying that Jesus is in the earth in the same way that Jonah is in the whale for three days and three nights. Now how many of you heard that before? Three days, three nights. How many believe that that's true? Three days, three nights. Okay, you got a problem if you follow some of the others, though, because they're going to tell you that he was on the cross on Friday. Taken off the cross before nightfall because the Jews cannot do anything after the sun goes down on Friday because that's Saturday. So they had to get him into the sepulcher. That's a cut-out place, like a you know, tomb. And leave him, and they can't do anything until Sunday morning. Okay, so now let's start. 
Put him in there. The sun goes down. So you got Friday night. Huh? Friday night. But to them, that is Saturday night. Because the same as Islam, when the sun goes down, we start counting the next day. So that was Saturday night and Saturday, right? How many days and nights we got? One. And then Sunday morning, he's already gone. So the most you got is two nights in a day. There's no way you can stretch it to say three. What they do in modern times, they say, well, yeah, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. But it says three days in the earth and three nights in the earth. Where are you going to get that from? And again, you have to really do some mental gymnastics and play with uh, a lot of stuff. Or, yeah, well, uh, you know, back then people did this or that. And you don't even know what you're talking about. We know what the people did back then. It's very clear. We're Muslims. We know exactly how the lunar calendar works. We understand it very clear. So do the Jews. That's why they don't accept it either. What does, what does the Quran say? Let's go to that. There's no two versions of the Quran. It's very clear. With a lot more clarity and a lot more beautiful statements about him and his birth. The birth of Muhammad is not detailed in the Quran, but the birth of Jesus is. Also his death. It says, they did not kittle, which means to kill, kittle him, nor did they salib him. Salib is what? Cross. They didn't crucify him. Rather, something they saw, which is mutashabihat, means that they've been in argument about it ever since. They, they have doubt in it. To have doubt in it, mutashabiyah, to have doubt in it. But for sure, they didn't kill him. They didn't put him on the cross. And he was pulled up by Allah and is going to come back in the last day. Now that and comes from Hadith, not from the Quran. But we know from the Hadith of Muhammad that uh, the, the messenger, Jesus, will be back in the last days. He will come down in Damascus and that he will definitely lead the believers to a victory over a common enemy. This is clearly spelled out in the Hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Who is looking for Jesus to come back? With no doubt in their heart about it at all. We have no doubt. If we doubt that, we can't even be a Muslim. For us, it's clear. By the way, do you mind if I make a, a, a comment from my side? This is just me saying something. But when I read that, at first, because I was a Christian coming and looking at this, I said, yo, oh, wait a minute, whoa, hold on. That, that, I don't know. But then I reflected on it a little bit and I said, yo, hold on. All of the verses talking about prayer in the New Testament, even telling us how to pray, Jesus is telling us how to pray. He's telling us to pray to God. Not once did I see him saying, pray to me. He said, pray to God. And when you pray, pray like this. Now, except for our Father, which Muslims would never say, the rest of it is fantastic. If you said, if you said our Lord, which art in heaven, we believe that that's, God is up. Hallowed be thy name. One of Allah's names is Quds, which means hallowed. So there's no problem there. Thy kingdom come. We definitely know Allah's will will come. Thy will be done. Well, there you just said it clearly. And that means Islam, God's will on earth, as it is in heaven. Wow. This is heavy. Then, saying to Allah, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespass. We do, do we ask for our rizq? Allah. Allah is our rizq. Again, we would say that. This sounds like a very good prayer from a real prophet, doesn't it? From who? Where am I getting my rizq? From Allah. You're saying, give us. Who? It doesn't say, Jesus, give me my bread. Jesus is telling them to say it to God. Ask him for what you need. And then ask him for forgiveness. Forgive us of our sins. 
or transgressions as we forgive those that transgress or sin against us. Wow. For thine is the kingdom and the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Whoa. Who doesn't say this? This is the Quran. No problem. The only problem is if we turned it around and said, well, you know, Muhammad is the one who actually spoke the Quran, so let's just pray to him. Eh, wrong. And when Muhammad, peace be upon him, quotes Allah, we never say that, oh, Muhammad must be God. For instance, and this is clear, when the prophet is saying that Allah said, my servant doesn't come to me with anything more beloved by me than what I've ordered him to do. This is a hadith. So we don't turn it around and say, okay, Muhammad said, my servant doesn't come to me with anything. No, 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 no. We say that he said that God said it. We don't leave that part of it out to make it look like that Muhammad is God. Right? Let's take the next question. It says, the Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Right? Actually, wrong. He doesn't say that. He said, doesn't that mean Jesus was God? May Allah help you. <laughs> I'm serious. Listen, even if, it, but the Bible doesn't say this, okay? We know now that a lot of that was excitement of translation. Let's give somebody credit. Don't call him a liar, but he's very enthused when he translated. This, is, this was actually a saying that came out of Egypt from the Coptic time, and it was put into the book. Uh, this is in John, yeah? That you'll find later on. But in any case, this was a saying prevalent even then that wasn't even related to the Christianity because it hadn't got there yet. The Bible says that in the beginning was the Word. I don't have a problem with that. Do you? That's okay. But I will say that Allah was before any Word, but Allah has no beginning anyway, so okay. And in the beginning was the Word. That's simply redundant, no problem. The Word was with God. Again, no problem. And the Word was God. Actually, it said in even Koine Greek, the word God. It didn't say was in the past tense or future or present tense of any verb. It just said the word God. Now what we know is that the first thing that happened is God, Allah, spoke the word, the kalama. He spoke a word and then everything came into being. Nothing came into being except by Allah's qadr, his order, when he said the word what was the word? Everybody tell me the word was? Kun. B. And that was the word. And Allah, and now if you understand that, how would it be that you said Allah spoke the word and the word was himself and he made himself? What? Does that really work in your mind? And if you said, well, that proves Jesus, why wouldn't it prove that Adam is God? Because Obviously, even from the text that we have today in English, Adam came about by what? Be, and he was. True or false? The same that we have in Islam, that Adam, made from dust, made from clay, suddenly Allah says, be, and he's alive. He blows breath into him, and he's alive. True or false? Is that what we know? So does that make him God? Allah speaks a word. The word becomes flesh. You didn't put that on here, by the way. That's part of the saying. The word became flesh. That's Adam. That's what it was talking about. Now, if it refers also to Jesus, still no problem, because we know that Adam was created in a miracle way, and so was Jesus. Right? Do you have a problem if somebody told you that God spoke the word and flesh came inside of Mary and she had a baby? No. That's what it says in the Quran. This is what the angel told Mary. She said, how am I going to have a baby when no man has touched me? He said, even so, this is the angel, Gabriel, saying, even so, for Allah, these things are easy. He just says, 
kum faya kum b and it is so there's no problem but how did you the, the what i'm saying allah gave you is because you took this and i don't know how you could get a reference to any person at all there's no name mentioned here and there's no name mentioned in my bible either it just said in the beginning was the word the word was with god it said the word was God, but of course we know that that's not what it says. And the word became flesh. But it doesn't say anybody's name. This could apply to Adam. It could apply to you and me. It could apply to anybody. And in fact, that's where some of the translators got at this idea that we are all the children of God. Because it says that in the Bible. You are all the children of God. So what would be the difference all of a sudden for one over the other? We could go back and look at the verses I mentioned earlier. Sons of God in Genesis, sons of God in Job, and the sons of God, or the son, begotten son in Psalms. you got tons of sons here. So when you don't even have a name and you say, that, doesn't that mean Jesus was God? This is what I'm saying. That's really, wow, nice stretch, big stretch. The fact is, you're saying it in English, go slow. There was no English at that time, so the Bible didn't say that, a translator said it. Second thing was, now the, in re-examining even the Kone Greek, they realized it didn't say it was, and I have the interlinear Bible to show you if you have a doubt about it. And then on top of that, how did you say that this was Jesus when it didn't say that? And we will agree, though, that it was Jesus for the argument's sake. Still, how did you prove that that was God? Because if you said, it's a miracle birth, therefore it must be God. I got one for you. Eve, how? Could somebody tell me her mother's name was, uh, I'm sorry? The mother of Eve is Adam? I love you, man. That was cool. Eve had no mother. This is a bigger miracle. I'm sorry where I come from. That's a much bigger miracle. A woman born out of a man? In the name of Eve. Why are you going to do that? How? How can you even think that the fact that, uh, that Jesus, peace be upon him, salam, that his miracle birth automatically makes him a God. But then you look at Eve and you know that she came from a bone in Adam and all of a sudden, oh, that's nothing. That's no big deal. <laughs> wow. And that's before we even look at the real big one. None of us exist today. Nobody in this room or on this planet exists except that we all came from Adam. And Adam's parents were named uh, uh, Dirt and Water. Yes or no? Yes. So I guess, what does that mean? Yeah, I mean... There's water in here. Do I pray to the water? There's dirt on my shoes. Is that my mother? What are we talking about? This, <laughs> I stop with a law. This is too much. But what happens, now, Muslims, listen to me. Don't make fun of people. Don't do that. But what's happened is that they have been fed a steady diet of lie after lie after lie for hundreds of and hundreds of years. This is not something that you're just going to walk away from and go, oh, I went to a funny speech tonight. I totally changed my mind. It didn't happen to me that way. It was very hard to deal with this subject because I had to believe it all of a sudden that the things that I grew up with were not true. There were many things, many, many things that after I got into Islam, I was able to look at and see a lot of stuff that we were handed just 
simply wasn't true. Some of those things I can tell you about today, other things I can't. There are certain things that you could say today that we know are not true, but if you say them, you get locked up. Because other people want to believe it even though there's no evidence for it. True or false? So be patient and be kind. Be respectful for other people's beliefs. Allah tells us in the Quran not, not to engage these people in a bad, hateful way, but rather in a way that is better. A way that is better, not worse. Now I've taken some liberties today and I've been really pretty tough in a way because I was trying to make some points to your mind that when you think about it later you think, well, even though he's kind of crude, still, how could, how could a man walking on the earth growing up you know, in a body, eating, drinking, going to the toilet, himself not knowing the future, according to the statements we have, even in the English Bible, that he doesn't know, but only the Father knows, then how are you going to turn around and say, okay, that's God? Except by years of a continuous saying the same thing over and over and over. Here's another one. I want to just, I'm just going to deal with the ones that are really coming to me about our lecture. It said, doesn't Jesus say that I and the Father are the same? If somebody, you don't have to acknowledge that you wrote this, but if you want to, just raise your hand, the one who wrote it, if you want to. If you don't want to, don't. Okay, because what I was going to ask you is if you had a new Bible that I didn't know about. <laughs> because all the others say, I and the Father are one. Does everybody know that one? Yeah. I don't know, they've got a new one out that says me and the Father are the same, then the problem you have, whether you say it like this or, or one, this would be easier actually to explain and, and it helps you to understand that obviously they're not the same because if you said myself and another entity are the same, then you made a comparison and did not indicate that you are one, right? Hmm? For instance, that man right there and myself, we're the same. Have you looked at him and you look at me and say, hmm, he's cuter than you, Yusuf. <laughs> now, uh, <laughs> you owe me. Anyway. <laughs> but you can look at us and see we're different, right? My beard is whiter than his mustache, right? Right? But if I said we're the same, you'd be like, how? We're both Muslims. True. Love Allah. Want to go to Jannah. Do Salah five times a day. We're the same. In what way? In what we believe and what we do. True. But are we one? Yeah. We're one in belief. We're one in our desire. We're definitely one in the direction we want to go. This is one. In our attitude. Yeah. But are we the exact same? Are we the same one living in the same body? I don't think so. No. The fact that you identify another object outside of yourself and then compare it to yourself means it's a comparison regardless of the conclusion you come up with. It can't be one and the same. Because that would be like me saying, well, me and myself, we're the same. Oh, okay, that's fine. Say that. Me and myself are the same. Me, myself, and I. All three of us are the same. No problem. That works. But as soon as you try to say that, well, me and anything outside of yourself is the same, then you're talking about in direction, in purpose, in appearance, something, but certainly not the same one. I'm glad you used the word same because you cleared it up for yourself. It doesn't, the word one, in this case, didn't mean the same one. It's not the same one. It's so good. Thanks. Like that. Good one. Another one. Nope. Not applicable. Was Jesus married? How many know the answer? Was he married? No. no. Okay. 
So that throws away all of those stories that they're coming up with about Jesus and running off with Mary Magdalene and having some kids and all the rest of it. No, don't get too excited here. Well, look at this. There are people who have believed this for almost 2,000 years. They consider themselves descendants of Jesus. They are the royal bloodline of Jesus, according to them. From the Mergovian Empire, and even into France, and even in the 1990s, there was a guy who really believed he was a descendant of Jesus. And they have an idea that someday they're going to be taking over the world. Oh, yeah. You don't, you don't believe me? Read Messianic Legacy. The research, these are real researchers that put it together, and the, and the difficulties they went through because of some of these guys playing with them. Messianic Legacy. Read it. You can get it at Barnes & Noble, Amazon Books. It's a good question. Thank you. Said, I saw a documentary about that in National Geographic. Oh, well, now there's a group of people that never lie. <laughs> These are the same people that said we came from monkeys, if we'll remember that. Thank you very much. <laughs> what does Islam say about that? Not the monkey thing, the other one. Uh, it's clear. We know that Jesus, when he comes back, he will get married. And he will have children. This is what we know from the Hadith of the Prophet. I don't know why you're interested in know that. Maybe it was from a sister. <laughs> it says here, this good question, Children, it says here, did Jesus say you must love your enemy according to Islam? No. No, you don't have to love your enemies. <sighs> that feels better already. <laughs> but by the way, I don't know any Christian groups today that are excited to practice that, especially if they consider that Terrorists are their enemies. I don't see them going out with flowers and candy. We love you, we love you, we love you. Come on, let's be practical, okay? Do you live in a real world or a dream world? What Islam teaches us though, and this is far more important, it teaches us we cannot abuse our enemies. It teaches us in Islam, it is forbidden to torture your enemies, for instance, making them remove their clothes and parade around with a dog collar on their neck. <laughs> and any other number of tortures that we may have heard about, Islam doesn't permit that. You cannot even put them down insult them, spit on them, things like this. It was never permitted. And I'll give you the closest evidence that I can off the top of my head about this. During a war, now people in confrontation to you, in war, battling you on the spot, shooting at you, stabbing at you, trying to kill you on the spot, would you consider that's an enemy, yes or no? Uh, this is a real enemy. And you're going to be out there loving them. I'm serious. Or you're fighting them. And this is normal. You should be fighting them because they're trying to kill you. They're trying to take away your country, trying to take away your, you know, whatever. And you're in the military, you're fighting. So what are you supposed to do? Fight. If nothing else, at least run real fast. <laughs> but you don't stand there and try to start a conversation. Well, don't you think we really should love each other? <laughs> Keeping that in mind, keeping, keeping that in mind, at the time of Muhammad, peace be upon him, there was a battle, and they were fighting their enemies. Their enemies were the mushrikeen, the idolaters, the pagans, who hated the fact that they were saying there was only one God. They didn't like it. They considered that perhaps Muhammad, peace be upon him, has been swayed over to the Jewish or the Christian religion. That's what they were considering that he's talking about this one God. So they didn't like that. They were fighting them, killing them. And in one of those battles, the cousin of the Prophet Muhammad named Ali, 
with his sword, was fighting against one of them, one of their enemies, and at that stage, the other one spit on him because it became obvious that Ali, I think he lost the man's sword broke or he dropped it. In any case, it became obvious he was going to be slaughtered right then and there. So he went and spit right on Ali. Now, ask yourself a fair question. What would you do in the same case? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because he was going to kill him anyway. He had it. It was ready to go. So he spit on him and he stopped. Yes or no? Yes. And what did he say? Because the, the man asked him, where did he just stop? Are you going to kill him or not? He said, had I killed you before, I would have been killing you for Allah. But if I do it now, it would be for myself. And that's not permitted in Islam. Do we really want to pursue this? Do you really want to know what Islam teaches? Yeah. Or do you want to just consider over and over, yeah, but, 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 yeah, but, 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 yeah, but, but, but. <laughs> I went through it. It wasn't easy. But somewhere along the line, you've got to take responsibility for your actions, and you've got to take responsibility for your mistakes. And say, I made a mistake. This is a boo-boo. And I want to correct it. I want to fix it. I want to go the right way. And then finally, when you realize that the best thing we can do is share, and that's what Muslims are supposed to do with everything. We're supposed to share our wealth. We're supposed to share in everything that we have and share in knowledge. Certainly, we should share Islam. True? Dot com. Shareislam.com. <laughs> Until next time, salam alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Oh, we got some news here. We got some special news. I just found out that someone wanted to enter Islam. So if you don't want to stay and see that, you can go ahead and go. Somebody wanted to enter into Islam. Is it from the sister's side or the brother's side? Who, oh, if you, <laughs> tell us, tell us your name. Asrim. Mashallah, it's very nice to meet you. Now, did you do you know about Islam? Uh, just for uh, three, four months. Oh, three or four months. That's more than I had when I got started. <laughs> you like Islam? Yeah. You believe there's only one God? I know it's only one God. You know it. Don't need to worry about that. <laughs> and you believe Muhammad is his messenger? Yeah. No doubt? <laughs> Easy. <laughs> Careful. Okay. Cool that. it. <laughs> yeah, that Muhammad is his messenger. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. it's no doubt. <laughs> okay, good. No doubt, she said. All right. Now, the next thing is, if you come into Islam, there are six things we believe. We believe in Allah. He's one, the only God. We believe in the angels. Allah has angels. Mm -hmm. We believe in the books. Allah sent books to people to read, to understand what is the religion, and we believe in the prophets, all the prophets of God. We believe in the day of judgment will be brought back for judgment, and we believe in Allah's power over everything. He already knows what's going to happen. You accept all that? Yeah. No doubt? No. Okay, good. Oh, what, what? Hold it. Easy. He's excited. <laughs> all right. <laughs> The next question I want to ask you is about the five things Muslims do. The first is to make a public declaration, which you're doing now. The next one is to establish worship five times a day. No problem? <laughs> I'm going to be uh, to learn everything. You're ready. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's great. And mm -hmm. we fast the month of Ramadan, and we pay zakat, charity, and we make hajj, pilgrimage. Okay? 
You sure? Yeah, I'm sure. You know, if you change your mind, we have to cut your head off. <laughs> no. Straight that out, back to tape up. <laughs> I can't believe he said that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and by the way, I'm from Texas. I can't help it. <laughs> Say this after me. Ever. Just repeat after me, okay? We're going to do it English and Arabic, okay? You know Arabic? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Ready? Yeah. Okay. I swear. I swear. There's no God to worship. There's no word, uh, God to worship. Except Allah. Except Allah. And I swear. And I swear. Muhammad is his messenger. Muhammad is his messenger. Okay, now hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> now we'll do Arabic. Ashadu. Ashadu. Anla. Anla. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illa Allah. Illa Allah. Wa. Wa. Ashadu. Ashadu. An Muhammad. An Muhammad. Rasulullah. Rasulullah. Now. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Okay, hold on, hold on. It's a custom of the Muslims that we always hug the new Muslims. <laughs> Isn't it? Huh? If it's boys, the boys hug them. If it's girls, the girls hug them. So go to the girls, they're going to give you a big hug. <laughs> MashaAllah. We're very happy for you, sister. Congratulations on coming to Islam. Hello, Akbar. It was worth a shot. <laughs> Another one? Allah Akbar! Allah Akbar! Allah Akbar! Woo! Oh my God! This is a lovely surprise, isn't it? You know why we're excited, by the way, some of you, you don't know why we're so excited. Anytime somebody enters Islam, if you're there, you get huge blessings from Allah. There's forgiveness that comes down on all of us, forgiving us and forgiving us, because anytime somebody enters Islam, it's like they were born again. They're coming into the fold of real submission to Almighty God. This is what Jesus preached, this is what John the Baptist preached, this is what Islam is teaching us, that this is really doing what you were created to do, to give over your will to the will of God. So after me, first of all, your name. It's very nice to meet you, and we're excited for you. Are you excited? Yes. Okay. And after, you heard what I told her, so you, everything's okay? All right. You can kind of look to everybody here so they'll know who you are, and you'll know who they are. These are going to be your new brothers and sisters, just in a couple seconds. Ready? I swear. I swear. There's no God to worship. There's no God to worship. Except the one true God. Except the one true God. Allah. Allah. And I swear. And I swear. Muhammad is his messenger. Muhammad is his messenger. Now the Arabic, Ashadu. Ashadu. An la ilaha. An la ilaha. Illallah. Illallah. Wa ashadu. Wa ashadu. An Muhammad. An Muhammad. Rasulullah. Rasulullah. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. <laughs> We are very happy for you. We're very, very happy for you. And I have something that I want to share. It takes about five minutes after we get done and tell you all about it. But these girls can't wait to give you a big hug. So get over there and greet your new sisters. MashaAllah. All right, God. Whew. One of these notes up here asked me a very special question and I didn't know how to respond to it so I didn't read it but I'll do it now there's somebody here who said that they are Muslim but they never got to do Shahada and they know it's a part of Islam they wanted to be able to do the Shahada and I know that everywhere I go I find Muslims that said you mean even I have to do it well why are you an exception you're a Muslim yeah why didn't you do Shahada he said, nobody ever told me. So the easiest way for you to do this, and it's a very beautiful thing in Islam, because from this moment, when you walk out of here, you'll have a whole new lease on life. You'll have strength that you never had before to fight against the devil. 
If you've never made Shahada, or if you want to renew your Shahada, and some of you know exactly what I'm talking about, we talk about some of the things that could cancel your Islam. This is a great time to join me, because I'm standing, I'm going to do it. Harris is going to do it. Stand up. If you want to renew your Shahada or make Shahada, okay, now if you don't believe there's only one God, don't stand up. And if you don't believe that, that if you don't believe that Muhammad's his messenger, don't stand up. But if you do believe it, this is a great chance to join all of us so that nobody really knows who did or didn't. It's fine, it's good, because Muslims bear witness every day, five times a day, we're all saying, I bear witness there's only one God to worship. So, what we're doing now, and I already understand where some of you are coming from. Oh, this is some new bit. Okay, good. Thank you very much for that. I got news for you. This is something very important to help the Muslims today who have never made shahada. And especially for those who would like to join Islam but didn't want to do it in front of a whole group looking at them. These two ladies had a lot of courage to walk up here. Last night in Stockholm, we had one ready to do shahada but just couldn't get in front of the people. So by us all getting up together, made it easy for her. And alhamdulillah, she accepted Islam along with us reaffirming our belief in la ilaha illallah. Now, if you don't want to do it, you don't have to. Fine and good. But me, I'll take any kind of ajr I can get from Allah if he accepts somebody's shahada and then lets me get forgiven along the way. I love it. Okay? And no hard feelings. If you don't want to do it, don't. Here we are. Remember this. If you don't believe it, don't stand up and don't say it. But if you do, okay. Ashadu. An la ilaha. Illallah. Wa ashadu. An Muhammad. Rasulullah. Allahu Akbar. Now that was the bid'ah part because the, the <laughs> Sahabi didn't say takbir, Allahu Akbar. <laughs> the important information for those who just accepted Islam and you weren't Muslim before, but now you know that you said it, you feel good about it, you want to do something about it, edgeless. Just one minute. When you said it, if you said it with sincerity, then on that place and in that time, Allah forgave any mistakes you made since the time you were born. All of it's gone. It's gone. Whatever you did before is gone. It's over. Shaitan has no power on you anymore. He has nothing to hold over you because you did the hardest thing there is to do and that's to overcome this arrogance of, hey, you know who I am? Because that's his problem. Now, the next thing for you to do is when Salah comes due, be sure you make wudu. For the ladies, and you, they'll explain some things to you about that. But if you're able to do the Salah, you should do the Salah. Be sure you get your head on the ground good. Because this is what shaitan can't do. Oh, yeah. And every time you do this, remember, he can't because he doesn't want to, and he won't, but you can. As much as you can do your salah every day, on time, as prescribed in Islam, this is something very good for you, for me, for all of us. And when it's time for Ramadan, the fasting is gonna be easy for you this time because you've got something working for you. And for some of the sisters, you didn't wear hijab, or maybe you wore it, took it off, forget about all that, that's over, history, tomorrow, come out with the best looking hijab there is. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Do it. Brothers, some of you scraping that stuff off your face every day, leave it alone. That's what the problem stuff on to say. Leave it alone. Okay? If you say, well, I don't get much hair, fine. You don't have to worry about it. If you get a lot, hey, cool. <laughs> but leave it alone. Okay? These are just little tips for us. But do your best above all things to remember Allah. And when you need anything, don't be looking at your horoscope. Don't be looking for a lucky horseshoe or a lucky rabbit's foot. Have you heard about the lucky rabbit's foot? Have you heard this? Did they have that over here? No. 
take a rabbit's foot and consider it good luck. It's not good luck for the rabbit. He's on crutches going, I didn't think that was lucky. <laughs> and knocking on wood and all that kind of stuff. Leave all of that alone. Just ask the law. May Allah accept from all of you, from us, and I ask Allah to forgive us for any mistake. Join us together in his genital for dosal al-Allah. <laughs>